Welcome once again to Horror Babble. Concluding our five weeks of Howard series is the Horror from the Mound, which first appeared in Weird Tales magazine in May 1932. We do hope you've enjoyed the series. Steve Brill did not believe in ghosts or demons. Juan Lopez did. But neither the caution of the one nor the sturdy skepticism of the other was shielded against the horror that fell upon them, the horror forgotten by men for more than three hundred years, a screaming fear monstrously resurrected from the black, lost ages. Yet, as Steve Brill sat on his sagging stoop that last evening, his thoughts were as far from uncanny menaces as the thoughts of man can be. His ruminations were bitter, but materialistic. He surveyed his farmland, and he swore. Brill was tall, rangy, and tough as boot leather, true son of the iron-bodied pioneers who wrenched West Texas from the wilderness. He was browned by the sun and strong as a longhorn steer. His lean legs and the boots on them showed his cowboy instincts, and now he cursed himself that he had ever climbed off the hurricane deck of his crank-eyed mustang and turned to farming. He was no farmer, the young puncher admitted profanely. Yet his failure had not all been his fault. Plentiful rain in the winter, so rare in West Texas, had given promise of good crops. But, as usual, things had happened. The late blizzard had destroyed all the budding fruit. The grain which had looked so promising was ripped to shreds and battered into the ground by terrific hailstorms, just as it was turning yellow. A period of intense dryness, followed by another hailstorm, finished the corn. Then the cotton, which had somehow struggled through, fell before a swarm of grasshoppers, which stripped Brill's field almost overnight. So. Brill sat and swore that he would not renew his lease. He gave fervent thanks that he did not own the land on which he had wasted his sweat, and that there were still broad rolling ranges to the west, where a strong young man could make his living riding and roping. Now, as Brill sat glumly, he was aware of the approaching form of his nearest neighbor, Juan Lopez, a taciturn old Mexican who lived in a hut just out of sight over the hill across the creek, and grubbed for a living. At present, he was clearing a strip of land on an adjoining farm, and in returning to his hut, he crossed a corner of Brill's pasture. Brill idly watched him climb through the barbed wire fence and trudge along the path he had worn in the short, dry grass. He had been working at his present job for over a month now, chopping down tough, gnarly, mesquite trees, and digging up their incredibly long roots and Brill knew that he always followed the same path home. And watching, Brill noted him swerving far aside, seemingly to avoid a low rounded hillock which jutted above the level of the pasture. Lopez went far around this knoll, and Brill remembered that the old Mexican always circled it at a distance. And another thing came into Brill's idle mind. Lopez always increased his gait when he was passing the knoll and he always managed to get by it before sundown. Yet, Mexican laborers generally worked from the first light of dawn to the last glint of twilight, especially at these grubbing jobs, when they were paid by the acre, not by the day. Brill's curiosity was aroused. He rose, and sauntering down the slight slope on the crown of which his shack sat, hailed the plodding Mexican. Hey, Lopez, wait a minute. Lopez halted, looked about, and remained motionless but unenthusiastic as the white men approached. Lopez, said Brill, lazily, it ain't none of my business, but I just wanted to ask you, how come you always go so far around that old Indian mound? No sabe, grunted Lopez shortly. You're a liar, responded Brill genially. You savvy all right. You speak English as good as me. What's the matter? You think that mound's haunted or something? Brill could speak Spanish himself, and read it too, but like most Anglo-Saxons, he much preferred to speak his own language. Lopez shrugged his shoulders. 
It is not a good place, no bueno, he muttered, avoiding Brill's eyes. Let hidden things rest. I reckon you're scared of ghosts, Brill bantered. Shucks, if that is an Indian mound, them Indians been dead so long their ghosts would be plumb wore out by now. Brill knew that the illiterate Mexicans looked with superstitious aversion on the mounds that are found here and there through the southwest, relics of a past and forgotten age containing the mouldering bones of chiefs and warriors of a lost race. Best not to disturb what is hidden in the earth, grunted Lopez. Bosh, said Brill. Me and some boys busted into one of them mounds over in the Palo Pinto country and dug up pieces of a skeleton with some beads and flint arrowheads and the like. I kept some of the teeth a long time till I lost them, and I ain't never been haunted. Indians? snorted Lopez unexpectedly. Who spoke of Indians? There have been more than Indians in this country. In the old times, strange things happened here. I have heard the tales of my people, handed down from generation to generation. My people were here long before yours and your brill. Yeah, you're right, admitted Steve. First white men in this country were Spaniards, of course. Coronado passed along not very far from here, I hear tell and Hernando de Estrada's expedition came through here, away back yonder, I don't know how long ago. In 1545, said Lopez, they pitched Camp Yondo where your corral stands now. Brill turned to glance at his rail-fenced corral, inhabited now by his saddle horse, a pair of workhorses, and a scrawny cow. How come you know so much about it? he asked curiously. One of my ancestors marched with de Estrada answered Lopez. A soldier, Porfirio Lopez. He told his son of that expedition, and he told his son, and so down the family line to me, who have no son to whom I can tell the tale. I didn't know you were so well connected, said Brill. Maybe you know something about the gold the Estrada was supposed to have hid around here somewhere. There was no gold, growled Lopez. The Estrada's soldiers bore only their arms, and they fought their way through hostile country. Many left their bones along the trail. Later, many years later, a mule train from Santa Fe was attacked not many miles from here by Comanches, and they hid their gold and escaped. So the legends got mixed up. But even their gold is not there now, because gringo buffalo hunters found it and dug it up. Brill nodded, abstractedly, hardly heeding. Of all the continent of North America, there is no section so haunted by tales of lost or hidden treasure as is the Southwest. Uncounted wealth passed back and forth over the hills and plains of Texas and New Mexico in the old days when Spain owned the gold and silver mines of the New World and controlled the rich fur trade of the West, and echoes of that wealth linger on in tales of golden caches. Some such vagrant dream, born of failure and pressing poverty, rose in Brill's mind. Aloud he spoke. Well, anyway, I got nothing else to do, and I believe I'll dig into that old mound and see what I can find. The effect of that simple statement on Lopez was nothing short of shocking. He recoiled, and his swarthy brown face went ashy. His black eyes flared, and he threw up his arms in a gesture of intense expostulation. Dios, no! he cried. Don't do that, Signor Brill. There's a curse— my grandfather told me. Told you what? asked Brill. Lopez lapsed into sullen silence. I cannot speak, he muttered. I am sworn to silence. Only to an eldest son could I open my heart. But believe me when I say better had you cut your throat than to break into that accursed mound. Well, said Brill, impatient of Mexican superstitions. If it's so bad, why don't you tell me about it? Give me a logical reason for not busting into it. I cannot speak, cried the Mexican desperately. I know, but I swore to silence on the holy crucifix, just as every man of my family has sworn. It is a thing so dark, it is to risk damnation even to speak of it. Were I to tell you, I would blast the soul from your body. But I have sworn, and I have no son so my lips are sealed forever. Ah, oh, well, said Brill sarcastically, why don't you write it out? 
Lopez started, stared, and to Steve's surprise, caught at the suggestion. I will. The Osby thank the good priest taught me to write when I was a child. My oath said nothing of writing. I only swore not to speak. I will write out the whole thing for you, if you will swear not to speak of it afterward, and to destroy the paper as soon as you have read it. Sure, said Brill to humor him, and the old Mexican seemed much relieved. Bueno, I will go at once and write. Tomorrow as I go to work I will bring you the paper, and you will understand why no one must open that accursed mount. And Lopez hurried along his homeward path, his stooped shoulders swaying with the effort of his unwanted haste. Steve grinned after him, shrugged his shoulders, and turned back toward his own shack. Then he halted, gazing back at the low rounded mound with its grass grown sides. It must be an Indian tomb, he decided, what with its symmetry and its similarity to other Indian mounds he had seen. He scowled as he tried to figure out the seeming connection between the mysterious knoll and the martial ancestor of Juan Lopez. Brill gazed after the receding figure of the old Mexican, a shallow valley cut by a half-dry creek bordered with trees and underbrush, lay between Brill's pasture and the low sloping hill beyond which lay Lopez's shack. Among the trees along the creek bank, the old Mexican was disappearing, and Brill came to a sudden decision. Hurrying up the slight slope, he took a pick and a shovel from the tool shed built onto the back of his shack. The sun had not yet set, and Brill believed he could open the mound deep enough to determine its nature before dark. If not, he could work by lantern light. Steve, like most of his breed, lived mostly by impulse and his present urge was to tear into that mysterious hillock and find what, if anything, was concealed therein. The thought of treasure came again to his mind, piqued by the evasive attitude of Lopez. What if, after all, that grassy heap of brown earth hid riches, virgin ore from forgotten mines, or the minted coinage of old Spain? Was it not possible? that the musketeers of Diestrada had themselves reared that pile above a treasure they could not bear away, moulding it in the likeness of an Indian mound, to fool seekers? Did old Lopez know that? It would not be strange if, knowing of treasure there, the old Mexican refrained from disturbing it. Ridden with grisly superstitious fears, he might well live out a life of barren toil, rather than risk the wrath of lurking ghosts or devils. For the Mexicans say that hidden gold is always accursed, and surely there was supposed to be some especial doom resting on this mound. Well, Brill meditated, Latin Indian devils had no terrors for the Anglo-Saxon, tormented by the demons of drought and storm and crop failure. Steve set to work with a savage energy characteristic of his breed. The task was no light one. The soil, baked by the fierce sun, was iron hard and mixed with rocks and pebbles. Brill sweated profusely, and grunted with his efforts, but the fire of the treasure hunter was on him. He shook the sweat out of his eyes, and drove in the pick with mighty strokes that ripped and crumbled the close-packed dirt. The sun went down, and in the long, dreamy summer twilight, he worked on, almost oblivious of time or space. He began to be convinced that the mound was a genuine Indian tomb, as he found traces of charcoal in the soil. The ancient people which reared these sepulchres had kept fires burning upon them for days, at some point in the building. All the mounds Steve had ever opened had contained a solid stratum of charcoal a short distance below the surface, but the charcoal traces he found now were scattered about through the soil. His idea of a Spanish-built treasure trove faded, but he persisted. Who knows? Perhaps that strange folk men now called mound builders had treasure of their own which they laid away with the dead. Then Steve yelped in exultation as his pick rang on a bit of metal. He snatched it up and held it close to his eyes, straining in the waning light. It was caked and corroded with rust, worn almost paper-thin but he knew it for what it was, a spur rowel, unmistakably Spanish with its long, cruel points. And he halted, completely bewildered. 
No Spaniard ever reared this mound, with its undeniable marks of aboriginal workmanship. Yet how came that relic of Spanish caballeros hidden deep in the packed soil? Brill shook his head, and set to work again. He knew that in the centre of the mound, if it were indeed an aboriginal tomb, he would find a narrow chamber built of heavy stones, containing the bones of the chief for whom the mound had been reared, and the victim sacrificed above it. And in the gathering darkness, he felt his pick strike heavily against something granite-like and unyielding. Examination, by sense of feel as well as by sight, proved it to be a solid block of stone, roughly hewn. Doubtless, it formed one of the ends of the death chamber, useless to try to shatter it. Brill chipped and pecked about it, scraping the dirt and pebbles away from the corners, until he felt that wrenching it out would be but a matter of sinking the pick point underneath and levering it out. But now he was suddenly aware that darkness had come on, and the young moon, objects were dim and shadowy. His mustang nickered in the corral, whence came the comfortable crunch of tired beasts' jaws on corn. A whippoorwill called eerily from the dark shadows of the narrow winding creek. Brill straightened reluctantly. Better get a lantern, and continue his explorations by its light. He felt in his pocket, with some idea of wrenching out the stone and exploring the cavity by the aid of matches. Then he stiffened. Was it imagination that he heard a faint sinister rustling, which seemed to come from behind the blocking stone? Snakes! Doubtless, they had holes somewhere about the base of the mound, and there might be a dozen big diamond-backed rattlers coiled up in that cave-like interior, waiting for him to put his hand among them. He shivered slightly at the thought, and backed away out of the excavation he had made. It wouldn't do to go poking about blindly into holes, and for the past few minutes, he realized, he had been aware of a faint, foul odor exuding from interstices about the blocking stone, though he admitted that the smell suggested reptiles no more than it did any other menacing scent. It had a charnel house reek about it, gases formed in the chamber of death, no doubt, and dangerous to the living. Steve laid down his pick and returned to the house, impatient of the necessary delay. Entering the dark building, he struck a match, and located his kerosene lantern hanging on its nail on the wall. Shaking it, he satisfied himself that it was nearly full of coal oil, and lighted it. Then he fared forth again, for his eagerness would not allow him to pause long enough for a bite of food. The mere opening of the mound intrigued him, as it must always intrigue a man of imagination, and the discovery of the Spanish spur had whetted his curiosity. He hurried from his shack, the swinging lantern casting long distorted shadows ahead of him and behind. He chuckled as he visualized Lopez's thoughts and actions when he learned, on the morrow, that the forbidden mound had been pried into. A good thing he opened it that evening, Brill reflected. Lopez might even have tried to prevent him meddling with it, had he known. In the dreamy hush of the summer night, Brill reached the mound, lifted his lantern, swore bewilderedly. The lantern revealed his excavations, his tools lying carelessly where he had dropped them, and a black, gaping aperture. The great blocking stone lay in the bottom of the excavation he had made, as if thrust carelessly aside. Warily, he thrust the lantern forward, and peered into the small, cave-like chamber, expecting to see he knew not what. Nothing met his eyes except the bare rock sides of a long, narrow cell, large enough to receive a man's body, which had apparently been built up of roughly hewn square-cut stones, cunningly and strongly joined together. Lopez! exclaimed Steve furiously. The dirty coyote! He's been watching me work, and when I went after the lantern, he snuck up and pried the rock out, and grabbed whatever was in there, I reckon. Blast his greasy hide! I'll fix him!" Savagely, he extinguished the lantern, and glared across the shallow, brush-grown valley. And as he looked, he stiffened, over the corner of the hill, on the other side of which the shack of Lopez stood, a shadow moved. The slender moon was setting, 
the light dim, and the play of the shadows baffling. But Steve's eyes were sharpened by the sun and winds of the wastelands, and he knew that it was some two-legged creature that was disappearing over the low shoulder of the mesquite-grown hill. Beating it to his shack, snarled Brill. He sure got something, or he wouldn't be traveling at that speed. Brill swallowed, wondering why a peculiar trembling had suddenly taken hold of him. What was there unusual about a thieving old greaser running home with his loot? Brill tried to drown the feeling that there was something peculiar about the gate of the dim shadow, which had seemed to move at a sort of slinking lope. There must have been need for swiftness, when stocky old Juan Lopez elected to travel at such a strange pace. Whatever he found is as much mine as his, swore Brill, trying to get his mind off the abnormal aspect of the figure's flight. I got this land leased, and I done all the work digging. A curse. Heck! No wonder he told me that stuff. Wanted me to leave it alone, so he could get it himself. It's a wonder he ain't dug it up long before this. But you can't never tell about them spicks. Brill, as he meditated thus, was striding down the gentle slope of the pasture, which led down to the creek bed. He passed into the shadows of the trees and dense underbrush, and walked across the dry creek bed, noting absently that neither whippoorwill nor hoot owl called in the darkness. There was a waiting, listening tenseness in the night that he did not like. The shadows in the creek bed seemed too thick, too breathless. He wished he had not blown out the lantern, which he still carried, and was glad he had brought the pick, gripped like a battle-axe in his right hand. He had an impulse to whistle, just to break the silence, then swore and dismissed the thought. Yet he was glad when he clambered up the low opposite bank, and emerged into the starlight. He walked up the slope and onto the hill, and looked down on the mesquite flat, wherein stood Lopez's squalid hut. A light showed at the one window. "'Packing his things for a getaway, I reckon,' grunted Steve. "'Oh, what the—' He staggered as from a physical impact, as a frightful scream knifed the stillness. He wanted to clap his hands over his ears to shut out the horror of that cry, which rose unbearably, and then broke in an abhorrent gurgle. "'Good God!' Steve felt the cold sweat spring out upon him. "'Lopez, or, or somebody—' Even as he gasped the words, he was running down the hill as fast as his long legs could carry him. Some unspeakable horror was taking place in that lonely hut, but he was going to investigate if it meant facing the devil himself. He tightened his grip on his pick handle as he ran. Wandering prowlers, murdering old Lopez for the loot he had taken from the mound, Steve thought, and forgot his wrath. It would go hard for anyone he found molesting the old scoundrel, thief though he might be. He hit the flat, running hard, and then the light in the hut went out, and Steve staggered in full flight, bringing up against a mesquite tree with an impact that jolted a grunt out of him, and tore his hands on the thorns. Rebounding with a sobbed curse, he rushed for the shack, nerving himself for what he might see, his hair still standing on end at what he had already seen. Brill tried the one door of the hut, and found it bolted. He shouted to Lopez, and received no answer. Yet, utter silence did not reign. From within came a curious, muffled, worrying sound that ceased as Brill swung his pick, crashing against the door. The flimsy portal splintered, and Brill leaped into the dark hut, eyes blazing, pick swung high for a desperate onslaught. But no sound ruffled the grisly silence and in the darkness nothing stirred, though Brill's chaotic imagination peopled the shadowed corners of the hut with shapes of horror. With a hand damp with perspiration, he found a match and struck it. Besides himself, only Lopez occupied the hut. Old Lopez, stark dead on the dirt floor, arms spread wide like a crucifix, mouth sagging open in a semblance of idiocy. Eyes wide and staring with a horror Brill found intolerable. The one window gaped open, showing the method of the slayer's exit, possibly his entrance as well. Brill went to that window, and gazed out warily. He saw only the sloping hillside on one hand, 
and the mesquite flat on the other. He started. Was that a hint of movement among the stunted shadows of the mesquites and chaparral, or had he but imagined he glimpsed a dim, loping figure among the trees? He turned back as the match burned down to his fingers. He lit the old coal-oil lamp on the rude table, cursing as he burned his hand. The globe of the lamp was very hot, as if it had been burning for hours. Reluctantly, he turned to the corpse on the floor. Whatever sort of death had come to Lopez, it had been horrible. But Brill, gingerly examining the dead man, found no wound, no mark of knife or bludgeon on him. Wait! There was a thin smear of blood on Brill's questing hand. Searching, he found the source three or four tiny punctures in Lopez's throat, from which blood had oozed sluggishly. At first he thought they had been inflicted with a stiletto, a thin, round, edgeless dagger. Then he shook his head. He had seen stiletto wounds. He had the scar of one on his own body. These wounds more resembled the bite of some animal. They looked like the marks of pointed fangs. Yet Brill did not believe they were deep enough to have caused death nor had much blood flowed from them. A belief, abhorrent with grisly speculations, rose up in the dark corners of his mind, that Lopez had died of fright, and that the wounds had been inflicted either simultaneously with his death, or an instant afterward. And Steve noticed something else. Scattered about on the floor lay a number of dingy leaves of paper, scrawled in the old Mexican's crude hand. He would write of the curse on the mound he had set. There were the sheets on which he had written. There was the stump of a pencil on the floor. There was the hot lamp globe, all mute witnesses, that the old Mexican had been seated at the rough-hewn table, writing for hours. Then it was not he who opened the mound chamber and stole the contents. But who was it in God's name? And who or what was it that Brill had glimpsed loping over the shoulder of the hill? Well, there was but one thing to do. Saddle his mustang and ride the ten miles to Coyote Wells, the nearest town, and inform the sheriff of the murder. Brill gathered up the papers. The last was crumpled in the old man's clutching hand, and Brill secured it with some difficulty. Then, as he turned to extinguish the light, he hesitated, and cursed himself for the crawling fear that lurked at the back of his mind. Fear of the shadowy thing he had seen cross the window, just before the light was extinguished in the hut. The long arm of the murderer, he thought, reaching for the lamp to put it out, no doubt. What had there been abnormal or inhuman about that vision, distorted though it must have been in the dim lamplight and shadow? As a man strives to remember the details of a nightmare dream, Steve tried to define in his mind some clear reason that would explain why that flying glimpse had unnerved him to the extent of blundering headlong into a tree, and why the mere vague remembrance of it now caused cold sweat to break out on him. Cursing himself to keep up his courage, he lighted his lantern, blew out the lamp on the rough table, and resolutely set forth, grasping his pick like a weapon. After all, why should certain seemingly abnormal aspects about a sordid murder upset him? Such crimes were abhorrent, but common enough, especially among Mexicans who cherished unguessed feuds. Then, as he stepped into the silent, star-flecked night, he brought up short. From across the creek sounded the sudden, soul-shaking scream of a horse in deadly terror, then a mad drumming of hoofs that receded in the distance, and Brill swore in rage and dismay. Was it a panther lurking in the hills? Had a monster cat slain old Lopez? Then why was not the victim marked with the scars of fierce hooked talons? And who extinguished the light in the hut? As he wondered, Brill was running swiftly toward the dark creek. Not lightly does a cowpuncher regard the stampeding of his stock. As he passed into the darkness of the brush along the dry creek, Brill found his tongue strangely dry. He kept swallowing, and he held the lantern high. It made but faint impression in the gloom, but seemed to accentuate the blackness of the crowding shadows. For some strange reason, the thought entered Brill's chaotic mind, that though the land was new to the Anglo-Saxon, 
It was in reality very old. That broken and desecrated tomb was mute evidence that the land was ancient to man, and suddenly the night and the hills and the shadows bore on Brill with a sense of hideous antiquity. Here had long generations of men lived and died, before Brill's ancestors ever heard of the land, and the night in the shadows of this very creek, men had no doubt given up their ghosts in grisly ways. With these reflections, Brill hurried through the shadows of the thick trees. He breathed deeply in relief when he emerged from the trees on his own side. Hurrying up the gentle slope to the railed corral, he held up his lantern, investigating. The corral was empty, not even the placid cow was in sight, and the bars were down. That pointed to human agency, and the affair took on a newly sinister aspect. Someone did not intend that Brill should ride to Coyote Wells that night. It meant that the murderer intended making his getaway, and wanted a good start on the law, or else Brill grinned wryly. Far away across a mesquite flat, he believed he could still catch the faint and faraway noise of running horses. What in God's name had given them such a fright? A cold finger of fear played shudderingly on Brill's spine. Steve headed for the house. He did not enter boldly. He crept clear around the shack, peering shudderingly into the dark windows, listening with painful intensity for some sound to betray the presence of the lurking killer. At last, he ventured to open the door and step in. He threw the door back against the wall, to find if anyone were hiding behind it, lifted the lantern high, and stepped in, heart pounding, pick gripped fiercely, his feelings a mixture of fear and red rage. But no hidden assassin leaped upon him, and a wary exploration of the shack revealed nothing. With a sigh of relief, Brill locked the doors, made fast the windows, and lighted his old coal-oil lamp. The thought of old Lopez lying, a glassy-eyed corpse alone in the hut across the creek, made him wince and shiver, but he did not intend to start for town on foot in the night. He drew from its hiding place his reliable old Colt forty-five, spun the blue steel cylinder, and grinned mirthlessly. Maybe the killer did not intend to leave any witnesses to his crime alive. Well, let him come. He or they would find a young cowpuncher with a six-shooter less easy prey than an old unarmed Mexican. And that reminded Brill of the papers he had brought from the hut, taking care that he was not in line with a window through which a sudden bullet might come, he settled himself to read, with one ear alert for stealthy sounds. And as he read the crude, laborious script, a slow, cold horror grew in his soul. It was a tale of fear that the old Mexican had scrawled, a tale handed down from generation to generation, a tale of ancient times. And Brill read of the wanderings of the caballero Hernando de Estrada and his armored pikemen, who dared the deserts of the southwest when all was strange and unknown. There were some forty-odd soldiers, servants, and masters at the beginning, the manuscript ran. There was the captain, de Estrada, and the priest, and young Juan Zavilla, and Don Santiago de Valdez, a mysterious nobleman who had been taken off a helplessly floating ship in the Caribbean Sea. All the others of the crew and passengers had died of plague, he had said, and he had cast their bodies overboard. So de Estrada had taken him aboard the ship that was bearing the expedition from Spain, and de Valdez joined them in their explorations. Brill read something of their wanderings, told in the crude style of old Lopez, as the old Mexican's ancestors had handed down the tale for over three hundred years. The bare written words dimly reflected the terrific hardships the explorers had encountered. Drought, thirst, floods, the desert sandstorms, the spears of hostile redskins. But it was of another peril that old Lopez told, a grisly lurking horror that fell upon the lonely caravan wandering through the immensity of the wild. Man by man they fell, and no man knew the slayer. 
Fear and black suspicion ate at the heart of the expedition like a canker, and their leader knew not where to turn. This they all knew. Among them was a fiend in human form. Men began to draw apart from each other, to scatter along the line of march, and this mutual suspicion that sought security in solitude made it easier for the fiend. The skeleton of the expedition staggered through the wilderness, lost, dazed, and helpless. And still the unseen horror hung on their flanks, dragging down the stragglers, preying on drowsing sentries and sleeping men. And on the throat of each was found the wounds of pointed fangs that bled the victim white, so that the living knew with what manner of evil they had to deal. Men reeled through the wild, calling on the saints, or blaspheming in their terror, fighting frenziedly against sleep, until they fell with exhaustion, and sleep stole on them with horror and death. Suspicion centered on a great black man, a cannibal slave from Calabar, and they put him in chains. But young Wanzavilla went the way of the rest, and then the priest was taken. But the priest fought off his fiendish assailant, and lived long enough to gasp the demon's name to Diestrada, and Brill, shuddering and wide-eyed, read, And now it was evident to Diestrada that the good priest had spoken the truth, and the slayer was Don Santiago de Valdez, who was a vampire, an undead fiend, subsisting on the blood of the living. And Diestrada called to mind a certain foul nobleman who had lurked in the mountains of Castile, since the days of the Moors, feeding off the blood of helpless victims, which lent him a ghastly immortality. This nobleman had been driven forth, none knew where he had fled, but it was evident that he and Don Santiago were the same man. He had fled Spain by ship, and Diestrada knew that the people of that ship had died, not by plague, as the fiend had represented, but by the fangs of the vampire. Diestrada, and the black man, and the few soldiers who still lived, went searching for him, and found him stretched in bestial sleep in a clump of chaparral. Full-gorged he was, with human blood from his last victim. Now, it is well known that a vampire, like a great serpent, when well-gorged, falls into a deep sleep, and may be taken without peril. But dear Strada was at a loss as to how to dispose of the monster, for how may the dead be slain? For a vampire is a man who has died long ago, yet is quick with a certain foul unlife. The men urged that the caballero drive a stake through the fiend's heart, and cut off his head, uttering the holy words that would crumble the long dead body into dust. But the priest was dead, and Diestrada feared that in the act the monster might waken. So they took Don Santiago, lifting him softly and bore him to an old Indian mound nearby. This they opened, taking forth the bones they found there, and they placed the vampire within, and sealed up the mound. Dios grant until judgment day. It is a place accursed, and I wish I had starved elsewhere, before I came into this part of the country seeking work, for I have known of the land and the creek, and the mound with its terrible secret, ever since childhood. So you see, Signor Brill, why you must not open the mound and wake the fiend." There the manuscript ended with an erratic scratch of the pencil that tore the crumpled leaf. Brill rose, his heart pounding wildly, his face bloodless, his tongue cleaving to his palate. He gagged and found words. That's why the spur was in the mound. One of them Spaniards dropped it while they was digging, and I might have known it had been dug into before, the way the charcoal was scattered out, but, good God! Aghast, he shrank from the black visions, an undead monster stirring in the gloom of his tomb, thrusting from within to push aside the stone loosened by the pick of ignorance, a shadowy shape loping over the hill toward a light that betokened a human prey, a frightful long arm that crossed a dim, lighted window. "'It's madness!' he gasped. "'Lopez was plum loco. There ain't no such things as vampires. If they is, why didn't he get me first instead of Lopez? Unless he was scouting around, 
Making sure of everything before he pounced? Ah, oh, hell. It's all a pipe dream. The words froze in his throat. At the window, a face glared and gibbered soundlessly at him. Two icy eyes pierced his very soul. A shriek burst from his throat, and that ghastly visage vanished. But the very air was permeated by the foul scent that had hung about the ancient mound. And now the door creaked, bent slowly inward. Brill backed up against the wall, his gun shaking in his hand. It did not occur to him to fire through the door. In his chaotic brain he had but one thought, that only that thin portal of wood separated him from some horror born out of the womb of night and gloom, and the black passed. His eyes were distended, as he saw the door give, as he heard the staples of the bolt groan. The door burst inward. Brill did not scream. His tongue was frozen to the roof of his mouth. His fear-glazed eyes took in the tall, vulture-like form, the icy eyes, the long black fingernails, the mouldering garb, hideously ancient, the long spurred boots, the slouch hat with its crumbling feather, the flowing cloak that was falling to slow shreds. Framed in the black doorway, crouched that abhorrent shape out of the past, and Brill's brain reeled. A savage cold radiated from the figure, the scent of mouldering clay and charnel house refuse, and then the undead came at the living like a swooping vulture. Brill fired point blank, and saw a shred of rotten cloth fly from the thing's breast. The vampire reeled beneath the impact of the heavy ball, then righted himself, and came on with frightful speed. Brill reeled back against the wall with a choking cry, the gun falling from his nerveless hand. The black legends were true then. Human weapons were powerless. For may a man kill one already dead for long centuries as mortals die? Then the claw-like hands at his throat roused the young cowpuncher to a frenzy of madness. As his pioneer ancestors fought hand to hand against brain-shattering odds, Steve Brill fought the cold, dead, crawling thing that sought his life and his soul. Of that ghastly battle, Brill never remembered much. It was a blind chaos, in which he screamed beast-like, tore and slugged and hammered, where long black nails like the talons of a panther tore at him, and pointed teeth snapped again and again at his throat. Rolling and tumbling about the room, both half enveloped by the musty folds of that ancient rotting cloak, they smote and tore at each other among the ruins of their shattered furniture, and the fury of the vampire was not more terrible than the fear-crazed desperation of his victim. They crashed headlong into the table, knocking it down upon its side, and the coal oil lamp splintered on the floor, spraying the walls with sudden flame. Brill felt the bite of the burning oil that spat at him, but in the red frenzy of the fight he gave no heed. The black talons were tearing at him, the inhuman eyes burning icily into his soul. Between his frantic fingers the withered flesh of the monster was hard as dry wood, and wave after wave of blind madness swept over Steve Brill. Like a man battling a nightmare he screamed and smote while all about them the fire leaped up and caught at the walls and roof. Through darting jets and licking tongs of flame, they reeled and rolled, like a demon and a mortal warring on the fire-lanced floors of hell. And in the growing tumult of the flames, Brill gathered himself for one last volcanic burst of frenzied strength, breaking away and staggering up, gasping and bloody. He lunged blindly at the foul shape and caught it in a grip not even the vampire could break, and whirling his fiendish assailant bodily on high, he dashed him down across the uptilted edge of the fallen table as a man might break a stick of wood across his knee. Something cracked, like a snapping branch, and the vampire fell from Brill's grasp to writhe in a strange broken posture on the burning floor. Yet it was not dead its flaming eyes still burned on Brill with a ghastly hunger, and it strove to crawl toward him with its broken spine as a dying snake crawls. Brill, reeling and gasping, shook the blood from his eyes, and staggered blindly through the broken door, and as a man runs from the portals of hell, 
he ran stumblingly through the mesquite and chaparral until he fell from utter exhaustion. Looking back, he saw the flames of the burning house, and thanked God that it would burn until the very bones of Don Santiago de Valdez were utterly consumed and destroyed from the knowledge of men.